Good afternoon and welcome to another Research in Action brought to you by the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. My name is Karen Scapinato. I will be today's moderator. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Lauren Brewster is a Senior Research Fellow at Florida Atlantic University's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, which is located in Fort Pierce. Her primary academic interests are the application of animal-borne tax and quantitative methods to better understand the behavioral ecology of large marine predators. She received her PhD in bi biological sciences at the University of Hull in the UK, and then moved to Western Australia for a bit. She just also told us that she has been living for about three years on the small island of Bimini in the Bahamas before joining the FAU Harbor Branch team in 2019, where she's now involved in several research projects that she will tell us about. Welcome, Lauren. Hi everyone, thank you very much Karen for that introduction. I'll just um, share my screen. Okay, I hope everyone can see that. Um, so today I'm gonna talk um, about a project. It's an ongoing project. Um, we've been, we started this actually, we were supposed to start it just as COVID hit. So unfortunately put a bit of a delay into, uh, into the works as it did for, for many researchers. Um, but before I get into it too much, I'll just, um, again, just go over briefly um, some of my background. So as Karen mentioned, um, I was in the Bahamas for three and a half years. Um, so I, I basically got into this field that I was fascinated by, um, by sharks and went out to Bimini Biological Field Station in 2010 to really get um, a good idea of what was involved in, in shark science, um, start trying to develop some questions um, and identifying some of the species that I wanted to work with and really um, get a very intense understanding and hands-on experience of, of what shark science um, and shark research is all about. Um, so up in the top left corner, um, this is a this was actually my first bull shark um, tagging experience. This was a large pregnant female bull shark. Um, and then for my PhD, um, based out in Bimini, Bahamas, I was working with juvenile lemon sharks, which is um, in this in this um, middle photo, um, and also juvenile nurse sharks in the top right. Uh, and basically applying accelerometers, which I'm going to talk to you in a lot more detail about shortly um, to try and understand more about the energy expenditure of these animals and also about um, their, their different behavior, how they partition their day into um, their, various, their various different behaviors. How much time do they spend eating or resting or swimming or um, bursting away from predators, trying to understand really their activity budget. Then um, I, I carried on some of this work out in Western Australia, and then since joining Harbour Branch, I've sort of diversified a little bit away from sharks, although this particular presentation is focusing on bull sharks. Um, so I started working a lot with Goliath grouper, um, one of the biggest reef fish that you can find, especially out here, um, really important for to recreational anglers out here, and um, again, using animal born tags to really understand what they're doing uh, with their time and also trying to understand um, how they're interacting with various different um, human related activities, whether it be fishing or unmanned underwater vehicles, um, if they're responding to boat noise, things like that. Um, and then more recently I've started working with um, eagle rays and also turtles as well. And I'm based up at Harbour Branch, FAU's Harbour Branch, which is in Fort Pierce. So a little bit further up um, the, the east coast of Florida than the main campus. And I'm in the Fisheries Ecology and Conservation Lab, um, Dr. Jamian's lab. So just to introduce you to the study species that I'm going to be talking to you about today. Um, I'm working, one of the projects I'm working on is with um, bull sharks. And they're one of the, the largest shark species in the largest order of sharks. So they're, they're known as a ground shark. There's over 270 species in that particular order of sharks. 
And they have a pretty wide distribution, actually. Um, they're circum global, as you can see. Um, this is their distribution illustrated in red on the on the world map below. Um, and they so they inhabit tropical and subtropical waters, and they're also Uri haline, which means that they can um, inhabit fresh and brackish water. So they can be found quite far inshore, um, actually up to about 700 miles inshore uh, in the Mississippi River, for example. Um, and we know that there's good nursery habitat, potential good nursery habitat um, in the US Atlantic coast that ranges from North Carolina all the way around to Texas. And typically this nursery, um, this nursery habitat is shallow brackish, intracoastal lagoons, um, riverine systems and things like that. Um, and they're usually between 60 and 80 centimeters when they're born. There's no parental care after these animals are born. They're fully fledged, um, perfect predators, um, but still at this size have predators of their own, usually larger sharks. So they'll use these nursery systems until they're about 1.9 meters. Um, so a, a good chunk of the first few years of their life, um, they're using these nursery areas. And these nursery areas are really important to them. Um, they're important during these, this vulnerable life stage. And um, they're, they're feeding here, they're seeking refuge from larger predators. And hopefully, if they can stay protected during the, this more vulnerable life stage, it will lead to increased recruitment to the population later on. So uh, in US coastal waters, the bull sharks managed as part of a complex with other coastal uh, sharks, and it's managed by the National Marine Fisheries Service. And they're considered near threatened by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So I'm gonna talk about one of the nursery areas that these bull sharks are inhabiting, um, that many of you may be familiar with, especially if you're Florida residents, and that's the Indian River Lagoon, or the IRL, as you'll hear me refer to it as. So um, the IRL, it spans about 156 miles along the east coast of Florida. It actually spans six counties. Um, about, so it's about 40% of Florida's Atlantic coastline, and it's been designated an estuary of national significance. So it's very diverse. Um, over 4,000 species of plants and animals have been identified as using this, um, this lagoon. And it's known to be a bull shark nursery. So it actually, it comprises three water bodies. There's the Mosquito Lagoon. Um, let me see if I can pull up my laser pointer. There's the Mosquito Lagoon right here. There's also the Banana River and the Indian River Lagoon. And actually the IRL extends um, further down um, to the study, the particular study site that I'm working in. Um, so the St. Lucie Estuary down near Port St. Lucie, the Stewart area. So the Indian River Lagoon, it's not only an estuary of national significance, not only very diverse in terms of the animals um, that use it, but it's also really important to, to Florida um, a, it was valued to be worth about 7.6 billion US dollars in 2016. So over 7.4 million visitors come to the IRL region uh, annually and between 31 and 46% of visitors are participating in some sort of Indian River Lagoon related activity, whether that's fishing or boating, um, diving even in some areas. So it's really important uh, for multiple reasons. Um, one of the reasons that this study is possible is because we've been working a lot um, to, to try and understand more about the way that the various different animals use this area. And we can do that um, through the use of passive acoustic receivers. So um, a way to basically track these animals. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. Um, but basically we have these listening stations dotted around the Indian River Lagoon and up the coast, and we're able to use these receivers to monitor their movement. But on top of that, there's also the Indian River Lagoon Observatory. Um, so basically, the, it's a network of environmental sensors, and this particular portion of the Indian River Lagoon is the study site that I'm working on. So um, this is the St. Lucie in, Inlet and the river. Um, and 
each of these little yellow dots represents um, an environmental um, sensor on Erlon. So it's used to measure um, things like um, dissolved oxygen, water temperature, um, there's wind speed, um, and also other things that can pertain to, to harmful algal blooms. So we can basically, there's the infrastructure here in the Indian River Lagoon to be able to monitor both animal movement with when these animals are fitted with the right kind of tag to do that, and also um, environmental variables as well. Unfortunately, um, the Indian River Lagoon, um, basically since the early 2000s, has started experiencing almost yearly harmful algal blooms or HABs. Um, and this is really problematic because a lot of harmful algal blooms produce toxins, which can be harmful to human or to animal health. So what are harmful algal blooms? Um, a lot of people, especially in Florida, um, hear about harmful algal blooms a lot in the news, um, particularly uh, red tide blooms, which happen primarily uh, on the West Coast. Um, and are often associated with sort of mac, well, with mass fish kills. Um, but harmful algal blooms are an overproliferation of photosynthetic organisms. And some of these algae species are able, as I mentioned, to produce toxins. And part of the reason that we're seeing more harmful algal blooms is because of warming water temperatures as a result of climate change. And also because there's more human activity and he more human development uh, close to the shoreline. And that is resulting in increased nutrients in the water, which really just combined with the warmer water produces this, um, this perfect environment for these photosynthetic organisms to, um, to bloom. <laughs> and there's lots of reasons why this is problematic. Um, it can result in ecological instability. Um, they tend to lower oxygen concentrations in the water, which can result in these fish kills. Um, and they, because they make the water more turbid and prevent light from being able to reach the, the substrate, it can, they can also result in seagrass die off. And a lot of the animals in the Indian River Lagoon, such as manatees, rely on the seagrass. Um, so very problematic for, for the animals inhabiting these areas where there are harmful algal blooms. On top of that, they can also result in public health concerns. So if shellfish that um, have these toxins in them are then consumed by people. It can cause um, shellfish poisoning. And also some of these toxins can aerosolize and they can be, we can literally inhale them and it can cause respiratory distress. And on top of that, I already mentioned that um, there's a lot of tourism associated with the Indian River Lagoon. Um, so if if the waters are, are full of these green tides, um, as you can see in the central picture, people generally don't want to be on the water with those. It doesn't look pretty, often doesn't smell very good. Um, and as I mentioned, it can be um, hazardous to human health. So people don't want to spend time in or on the water when these blooms are appearing. And it can also be costly to clean up the beaches after they've occurred as well. And this map here, um, on the right, this shows uh, the Indian River Lagoon and just the, the primary type of harmful algal bloom that is occurring in different bodies of water in the Indian River Lagoon. So I'm working primarily down here with the bull sharks. Um, so you can see that microcystis harmful algal blooms because there's many different types, but microcystis are the ones that um, predominantly occur in the study site in which I'm working. So just before I jump into to the portion of the project um, that I'm working on, we've had a recent graduate student, Michelle Edwards. Um, she finished her master's last summer and did a fantastic job looking at the or bull shark exposure to different um, toxins. And basically she took samples from 50 different bull sharks and was looking at um, toxin exposure through the liver to look at bioaccumulation in blood plasma to really try and get a sort of a snapshot view of what toxins might be accumulating in the shark's blood. And also at stomach contents to look at a potential exposure pathway to these toxins through their prey. 
And what she found is that um, there were various different um, harmful algal blooms um, toxins in these different um, tissues or in, and different samples, but um, two particular toxins, demeric acid and microcystins, were um, higher in stomach contents, which really suggests that they're probably being exposed to toxins through their prey. And juvenile bull sharks, they'll tend to eat um, hypanid stingrays, but also striped mullet and uh, different types of catfish. And she basically found that there was this persistent low level um, toxin presence in these different tissues. And that these toxins were also being found in the prey items. She also found that there was no real seasonal difference in toxin prevalence in these tissues, which is indicating that although a lot of the harmful algal blooms are occurring during the wet season or the summer, for um, potentially a number of reasons, these toxins could potentially be prevalent in the Indian River Lagoon throughout the year. And that might be because some toxins are able to settle into the substrate and persist there. And then things like mullet will sometimes forage through the, through the substrate and might be able to resuspend it that way. Um, and also they can persist in some of the invertebrates that um, some of the bull shark prey items are then consuming, uh, which are then obviously subsequently being consumed by the bull sharks. So there's um, different potential exposure pathways for these bull sharks to accumulate toxins, but it looks like it's primarily coming through their prey. But what does this mean? What does any of this mean? Like, how, what are the bull sharks doing in response to harmful algal blooms? And that's the question that we're really trying to get at at the moment. But we've had a slight issue, which I'll, um, <laughs> I'll explain shortly. But to try and really get at this question, I've been using an animal born tag. So, this particular tag, um, it's attached to the first dorsal fin of the bull shark. So, that iconic fin that breaks the surface of the water, if you've ever watched Jaws, um, that's its dorsal fin. And basically this multi-sensor tag is, in, um, is comprised of an acoustic transmitter, which I'll explain what that does in a little bit more detail shortly. A spot tag, which basically um, once the tag comes to the surface, allows us to get a GPS coordinate for that particular tag so that we can go out and retrieve it. And then, it's also got um, this little tiny white thing here, which is an accelerometer, magnetometer, pressure and temperature sensor. Um, and that's really what's giving us an idea of their behavior or that activity level. And I'll show you how in just a minute. But I wanted to design a tag package that I could attach to the dorsal fin of these juvenile bull sharks that would detach and pop to the surface after a predetermined number of days. And that's facilitated by something called a galvanic timed release, which is this silver barrel. And this barrel basically corrodes over either five or seven days, depending on which one I use, um, and allows the, the tag to release from the fin and it's positively buoyant. So it will pop to the surface and we can go and collect it. And if we can't find the tag, we're not able to get any data back. We have to be able to physically retrieve um, this white portion, the accelerometer portion, to be able to download any data. So it turns into a real treasure hunt once we, once we hear from the satellite tag within the, within the tag. And basically, um, this doesn't leave anything on the, on the shark after it's released. And it gives us a huge, huge amount of data. So um, these tags, the accelerometer tag, for example, is logging 150 data points per second in the three different axes, so the X, Y, and Z axis. And basically, it allows me to understand um, exactly what these animals are doing and their activity level. And I can look at how that might change over the seasons, for example, or day versus night. And ultimately, I'm wanting to collect a lot of control data, so when they're not experiencing harmful algal blooms, so I know what their normal behavior is, and then compare that to data collected on bull sharks that are experiencing a harmful algal bloom. So 
what are accelerometers? Um, usually when I say to somebody, oh, I work, I work with accelerometers, they give me a blank look. And it's because most people don't realize that they're interacting with this technology on a daily basis. So if any of you have the easiest one nowadays is a smartphone, um, and you flip your phone from portrait to landscape, it's the accelerometer in your device, which is detecting that change in movement and is flipping the screen, uh, the orientation of the screen. Um, likewise, if you use um, Fitbits or um, Apple Watches, anything like that that's able to monitor your activity, um, it's the accelerometer in that, for example, that is detecting your footsteps. So applying these to animals, uh, we can use accelerometers to get a thorough understanding of an animal's body movement and also their posture. So for example, if you're working with an animal that rests a lot or lays down a lot, you can work out whether they're laying on their side, on their front, on their back. Um, and this data can be used for, for good classification into different behaviors. And that's all happening on board your watch if you use a Fitbit or um, some sort of activity watch. So I'm going to talk you through uh, what some of this data looks like so you can get an, a better understanding of it. But I also just wanted to mention that they're often paired with magnetometers. So a magnetometer looks at angular rotation rather than the actual movement of whatever the, an accelerometer is attached to. And uh, it, again, it can be used to look at body orientation and it can be used to extract a compass heading. And this is all done in relation to the Earth's magnetic field. But one of the reasons that they're often coupled with accelerometers is because um, if you take some of the data that's, um, that you can uh, extract from an accelerometer and you couple that with, for example, the compass heading from a magnetometer, you can generate something called a pseudo track. Um, so sort of a recreation of the animal's path over time, which is pretty cool and provides um, context for some of the behaviors that you might be seeing, provides a spatial context. So just to, to show you what some accelerometer data looks like um, and try and make it a little bit more digestible for you. So um, if I was to... So you've got your phone here, and if you imagine there's three axes, or there are three axes running through it. So you've got your Y axis, your um, Z axis from front to back, and your X axis from side to side. So if you think of your, your phone as something that you can just attach directly to an animal, such as this resting dog in a hammock, um, you might want to say, for example, attach your phone to the head of the head, lay your phone on the dog's head. And the Earth's gravitational pull is going to pull down on this Z axis, this axis that's going from the front to the back of your phone. So what you'll see is um, basically this behavior being represented in that Z axis, because that's where the Earth's gravitational pull is acting stronger, most strong. So I'm going to show you what some of that data looks like. Oh, if I can turn my laser pointer off. So if your phone is resting on the dog's head, you're gonna see that down here around 1G. If the dog were to roll over and lay on its back and flips the phone over with it, you're gonna see um, 1G, but at the other end of the axis. If I'm attaching my, my phone to my chest and I'm walking, because you're gonna see that um, a slight bob in my head, unless I'm learning to walk with a book on my head, you're gonna see a slight bob in my head as I walk. You're gonna see that in the Y axis, um, which is going from the top to the bottom here. And you're gonna be able to see those footsteps as I do that in the Y acceleration trace. Extending that a little bit further, when you run, because those footsteps are more exaggerated and that Y axis or that heave acceleration is more exaggerated, you're gonna see more exaggerated um, peaks and troughs in the Y acceleration axis. You can see that here. 
So hopefully you can see that somebody running versus somebody walking looks quite different. Likewise, if somebody is jumping up and down, again, that Y acceleration axis or the heave acceleration is going to be even further exaggerated. And then if I was to shake my head from side to side, which is what I tended to see with the juvenile lemon sharks out in Bimini Bahamas when they were capturing their prey, they would shake their head very vigorously from side to side to be able to tear their prey item apart before consuming it. So if I have my phone attached to my chest and I shake from side to side, I'm gonna see that in the X axis or the sway axis. So here you'll expect to see that side to side movement in this green X axis. So hopefully that gives you an understanding of what some of the data looks like and how it is that we're able to in, um, interpret these squiggly lines. Um, but when you're attaching it to a shark, you get the static acceleration, which is in blue, and the um, dynamic acceleration, which is represented here in red. So the backwards forwards acceleration is your surge axis. Your heave, again, is your up-down axis, so you're jumping up and down, um, or you're walking or running, if it was attached to a person. And the sway acceleration axis is the one that's most important when we're looking at fish like this, because they're beating their tail from side to side. And with each tail beat, their body is moving from side to side. And actually, you can often see this um, from the head of the shark as well. So if you're looking at one particular axis for, for a shark, it would be the sway acceleration axis, the side to side movement that helps you to be able to understand the behavior. And you can see that here. This is, um, I'm gonna show you some footage from a Goliath grouper that had an accelerometer and magnetometer package attached to it, but also um, a, a video camera. And you can see that side to side movement that I'm talking about. Again, this, this Goliath grouper is beating its tail and you can see in the sway acceleration axis, each of those individual tail beats. Down here is the magnetometer data. And again, it looks like a lot of squiggly lines. It is a lot of squiggly lines, but I just wanted to show you that as the animal changes directions, changes direction, you're getting this, um, the change in these axes. And this animal is about to, to go and rest in a wreck. And you can see that this sway acceleration axis um, basically flatlines here as it ceases to beat its tail and, and comes to rest. So that's how we're able to interpret this data. Obviously, if you have a video camera incorporated into your animal tag, um, it takes all of the guesswork out of, uh, of what those, that data is representing. This is um, just some examples of um, the, the signatures for different behaviors for a lemon shark. And we could expect that this would be very similar for a bull shark as well. Um, and don't worry too much about this, this graph at the bottom, but I just wanted to show you that th these are the three, um, the three different axes from the accelerometer. So the X, Y, and Z, or the heave, surge, and sway axes for different behaviors. Um, and you can see how different each of these look. So this is, um, what we refer to as a chafe, where the shark might be swimming along and then will go and roll perhaps against the substrate. And this might be um, as a way to dislodge parasites or a tag, for example. Then um, you've got this regular tail beat here during steady swimming. This is the shark bursting, and that might be chasing a prey item or bursting um, away from potential predator. This flat line here is um, the juvenile lemon shark resting. And then here where you get um, these really intense squiggly lines that are all really close and have um, a large amplitude uh, represent the head shaking behavior, which for the lemon sharks and likely for the bull sharks represents prey manipulation. So that's, that's an example of what this data looks like that we're getting from the white portion of this tag. But I also mentioned that there's this thing here, 
something that looks like a little black bullet that's protruding from the front of the tag. And that's for monitoring the space use of the animal. It's called an acoustic transmitter. And basically each acoustic transmitter has a unique code that it's pinging um, on a continuous loop. And as it passes near one of these uh, receivers, which are located throughout the Indian River Lagoon, um, thanks to uh, a collaborative network. Um, so lots of different organizations contributing and maintaining these receivers. These receivers will pick up the unique code for the tag that that animal is carrying, and it will log the ID and the time um, and date. So basically we can reconstruct the animal's path so long as it passes near one of these black dots, one of these um, receivers. So basically, we have this tag that allows us to look at the space use of the animal. And in addition to that, the very fine scale behavior actually on a sub second basis if we want to look at it at that level. So we then have to go out and put the tags on the animals. So we go out and we set drum lines in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, these are uh, baited with some of the favorite prey items, so mullet in this case. And we leave them out for about half an hour and hopefully we'll catch a bull shark. And we can pull up this line, bring the animal on board the boat. And then we put a hose in its mouth so that we're constantly pumping um, ambient seawater over its gills so it can breathe fine. Take a number of uh, measurements from it. So um, record things like um, length, whether it's male or female, um, take some DNA samples, um, and record all of this data. We give it an ID tag so that if someone recaptures that animal, um, they can basically send this information into NIMPS and we can find out um, where it was recaptured, um, ideally if the, if the angus managed to take any uh, length measurements, how, how much it's grown since it was originally tagged or from when it was or previously caught. Then we also attach um, this novel multi-sensor tag that we designed here at Harbour Branch. Then we release the animal back into the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, where we've caught it, and hopefully in five to seven days or thereabouts, the tag will pop off the animal and we will get an alert from the satellite tag. And the satellite tag will give us an indication of where to go and look for the tag um, and a rough idea of how certain it is um, that it's in that location. It will say, for example, we think it might be within 150 meters of this um, GPS location, or it could be within several hundred meters. So we have to go out and track the tag, hopefully spot it, which is why it's bright orange. And we found them on beaches, um, floating in the middle of the Indian River Lagoon um, and offshore of Fort Pierce as well. And buried way, way back in mangroves. Um, that one took us a while to find. But hopefully we can spot the tag, we can recover it and download the data. So I've done this now, I think for 17 sharks. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately for the sharks, unfortunately for, for this project, we haven't had any harmful algal blooms since we started. So we've got a lot of baseline or control data. Um, in reality, this is a great thing. It's a great problem to have because for all the reasons I listed earlier in the, the presentation, harmful algal blooms aren't good um, for the Indian River Lagoon and its inhabitants and for the people living around the Indian River Lagoon or visiting it. So basically, I have a lot of control data and I can um, spend my time at the moment trying to work out what bull sharks are doing on, on a regular basis under normal conditions. So as I mentioned, um, I've put about 17 tags out so far. We've, lo we've lost one um, until recently. We've had a little bit of a, of a bad streak recently. So if we have any people um, out on the Indian River Lagoon and you spot any of these bright orange tank, uh, tags, please give us a call because we really need them back. Um, but we've been putting them on uh, juvenile bull sharks up to 182 centimeters, um, all caught in the St. Lucie um, estuary area. 
and we've had a relatively even split of males and females and across the different seasons as well. Um, and the longest, the longest attachment time has lasted for about 303 hours. And I mentioned um, earlier on that one of, the, one of the cool things about including a magnetometer in this tag package alongside an accelerometer is the ability to reconstruct the animal's path or generate something called a pseudo track. So that's what I've done here. Um, I just wanted to show you an example. Um, so basically the colors here are just representing the level of activity. So essentially how fast the shark is swimming. Um, but not in meters per second here, just a relative um, a rel relative indication of activity. And you can see that there's this bright green um, bright green portion of the track to start with, and it's relatively straight. And that's probably indicating that after we released this shark, it swam away um, in a relatively directed fashion at um, elevated speed uh, after we released it. So essentially, I think of it as them swimming away from their alien abduction um, and recovering from, um, from this handling process. And then as time goes on, it sort of relaxes into what you can see is a, a more normal activity level with these darker blue colors. And at points, the track becomes more tortuous and you can't see it particularly well in here, but in some of these really tortuous um, portions here, there's some bright red um, so the shark is, is bursting, it's exhibiting very high activity. And because it's happening when these paths are particularly tortuous, that suggests to me, for example, that this animal might be hunting. It might be chasing and um, chasing its prey. And that's the benefit of being able to, to look at the pseudo track in tandem with the activity data. It gives you a little bit more context to determine what the shark might be doing if you can't incorporate something like a video camera into the tag. Okay, so going back to the, the spatial component, that small passive um, acoustic transmitter, the black bullet that protrudes out the front of the tag, um, using this information and information that was downloaded from all of these passive um, receivers, the black dots, was able to um, reconstruct the animal space use um, with this particular method. So with the pseudo tracks, um, you don't really want to assign that to particular locations on the map because those pseudo tracks will um, slowly accumulate error um, the longer they go on because the animal speed will change, for example, and they're facing different currents. Um, so in terms of the spatial um, movement, we really want to rely on the passive, um, passive telemetry. And this, um, these are just different tracks of some of the different sharks that we've tagged. And as the, oh, I just realized I've cut off the, um, the legend on that, so I apologize. But basically when it's purple here, um, it's indicating that this is still a relatively young track, but as it goes on and it moves towards these um, hotter, bright pink colors, that's indicating that um, the tag has been on the animal for longer. So for example, this would, might be the 303 hour track as opposed to one of these shorter tracks here. But really what I want you to take away from this is that these animals are using only very small portions of the area close to where they were captured. So they exhibit very limited movement. And this was something that Michelle found um, in her master's thesis and that we're further corroborating with this data. Um, and this, you know, this is potentially worrying in terms of harmful algal blooms. Um, if they're tending under normal conditions to use very restricted areas and those areas are then potentially faced with a harmful algal bloom, what does it mean for these sharks? Um, are they able to just potentially change their depth if um, the harmful algal bloom is um, stratified or do they need to move to a different area? So um, then moving on to, to just show you some of the data from, from the very fine scale portion of the tag. Um, I mentioned there's a pressure sensor in there for looking at the depth use. And this shows the depth trace of the animal. So they're in relatively shallow water. You know, most of these animals aren't going deeper than about six to seven meters. So they're, they're 
up these rivers and sometimes using these these channels sometimes using these channels and getting um into deeper depths there but what i was tending to see from this again this color from this um on on this graph re represents the activity level of the animal and again, you can see this post-release behavior that was reflected in the pseudo track. So higher activity level for the first few hours after the animal was released. Um, and again, you can see these bright red periods um, really happening at the surface. So that might be indicating that either feeding at the surface or this might also be interactions with boating, uh, with boats, boating activity. And I'm also finding that these animals are most active around lunchtime, which is interesting. This might be because it's easier for them to see their prey at this time of day in the very turbid waters of the Indian River Lagoon. But again, it might also reflect more boaters being on the water during the middle of the day and then navigating um, this, this traffic basically. The other thing that I'm finding is that as with the juvenile lemon sharks out in Bimini Bahamas, they're um, more active during the summer or during the wet season than they are during the winter. Um, and this isn't overly surprising. Um, it's, it's easier for them um, physiologically to be more active when the water temperatures are, are higher, um, but also their metabolic demands are gonna be higher during the summer. Um, these are cold-blooded animals and water temperature really affects their energy expenditure. So because they are expending more energy, they also need to consume more. So it's easier for them to move faster and more um, during the summer, but they also need to spend more time potentially moving to capture prey to meet these energy demands as well. So um, just to start wrapping things up, um, hopefully you can see that by using these animal born tags, we can start to understand a lot more about these animals, um, not just bull sharks, but also um, Goliath grouper, the eagle rays that we're working on. These, these sort of tags are being applied to a lot of um, marine predators, and it's, you know, it's really advancing our understanding of their ecology, because in most cases, particularly when they're in environments like the Indian River Lagoon, where um, it's so turbid, you can't actively see what the animals are doing and follow them everywhere to directly observe them. These tags really give us an insight into what these animals are doing, when and where they're doing them. As I just mentioned, we can also use these tags to get a really good indication of energy expenditure. We can also use them to look at their post-release behavior. We can get an understanding of um, how long it's taking them to for example, um, resume normal behavior after we've interacted with them and we've put the tags on. Um, and we can use this in some instances to try and inform best handling practices. For example, um, we're wanting to look at um, potential different ways to release the live grouper and get them back down to depth after recre recreational anglers have brought them up. Um, these animal born tags are a perfect way to, to look at best ways to do this. Um, we can also, especially when you have as much control data as, as I do at this point, you can use that to then compare their behavior to stochastic events, environmental events, whether that be harmful algal blooms or hurricanes, for example, um, which we obviously get, or storm events, which we obviously get relatively frequently here in Florida. And we can also look at um, how these animals might behave in different systems. So for example, do bull sharks in the Indian River Lagoon um, behave the same way on a day-to-day -day basis and between seasons and across these different habitats as for example, uh, juvenile bull sharks on the East Coast of Florida. Um, we're looking at potentially um, seeing how bull sharks are behaving near the power plant on, um, sorry, on the West Coast of Florida. And are they potentially vulnerable in response to various different human related activities? Um, you know, is there any post, um, post release mortality from angling interactions, for example, anything there that might potentially influence recruitment to the rest of the population during this vulnerable life stage and when they're in these nursery habitats that are supposed to afford them protection? 
but are increasingly um, experiencing um, human activity. So the main takeaways from this is uh, ultimately we want to see how they're responding to harmful algal blooms, but um, unfortunately, but thankfully, we haven't experienced any since we've started the, the project. Um, they will happen. We're sitting and waiting patiently um, for them to for them to happen. Um, and we have uh, eyes on the water constantly and these environmental sensors monitoring for, for indicators of harmful algal blooms. So when we get them, we will be going and trying to put these tags out as quickly as possible. Um, if you are an angler that spends time on the Indian River Lagoon and you catch a bull shark with one of these, um, these small yellow or blue tags attached to, um, attached to the dorsal fin, grab the number on it, give us a call, let us know where you caught it. If you can safely measure it, that's great. Um, but information like that is really helpful for us being able to understand, again, more about their movement and their life history. Um, and if you happen to see one of these bright orange tags um, somewhere in the Indian River Lagoon or even offshore, um, please grab it for us. Hopefully it will still have the phone number on the tag, but if not, um, there's the phone number here or just give us a call at Harbour Branch and um, just say we found a shark tag and someone will definitely be able to put you through to the right people. So with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone involved with this project. Um, it's definitely um, a, a large collaborative project that includes a lot of people for both going out and catching the sharks and also trying to uh, or trying to find them, being involved with that treasure hunt on the back end. Um, also, thank you very much to the engineering team here at Harbour Branch that have been instrumental in helping us um, design this tag package. Um, and to, to the funding bodies as well, Harbour Branch Oceanographic Institute Foundation and then Save Our Seas. And also thank you to everyone that contributes to uh, receivers to the FACT network. And with that, I'll take any questions and just leave this slide for a minute. Um, this is just some, some different ways to get involved with Harbour Branch. Um, it's, it's, a big, it's a big year for us this year um, and there's, there's a lot going on. So check out the Harbour Branch website as well. Great. Thank you very much, Lauren. Yeah. Um, we do have a few questions. Just as a reminder, if you have a question for Dr. Brewster, please uh, go to the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen and you can type the questions there and we're going to go through them as they come in. All right. So, Lauren, very interesting topic. Uh, I'm kind of glad we hadn't had any harmful algal bloom. It's yeah. a little bit bad for your project, obviously. Um, so here's our first question. Um, how does the uh, tracker come off the shark, uh, shark, excuse me, and how do you factor in the possibility of catching the same shark and re-tagging it, or does that matter to you? Um, great questions. So um, it's a little hard to explain exactly how we attach it and how it comes off, but um, basically, let me see if I can go back to the right slide. Um, we use something called a, a galvanic timed release, which is uh, it's a small metal barrel that corrodes in seawater. Um, so, and basically the bigger the barrel, the longer it takes to corrode. Um, so, sorry, there you go. Um, this, this silver barrel corrodes over time and um, there's some, some fishing grade essentially, which is um, the two ends are sitting within that barrel and it loops through the shark's fin. And as that barrel corrodes over time, the two, the ends of the barrel, uh, sorry, the ends of the braid become free. And because the tag's positively buoyant, it just pulls the braid through the shark fin and the whole thing comes off of the, the shark and floats to the surface. So after a maximum apparently is 303 hours, um, this, the whole thing will come off and nothing's left on, on the animal. So it's free to heal without without anything inhibiting that. Great. Um, and then the second question, um, does it matter if we tag the same individual twice? No, it doesn't. Uh, actually, I, it was great for me to do that, particularly in, in Bimini, Bahamas. If you can get um, the same animal twice, particularly if you can get it in the, the wet season and the dry season, that's an ideal scenario because you don't have to worry about individual variation um, impacting 
the behavior. You can directly compare the animal's behavior between the two different seasons. Um, we haven't had any recaptures um, to tag multiple times in this case. Um, I would love that. It also is always reassuring to see a tagged shark again as well and be able to take pictures of the fin so you can see how well the animals healed after the tagging process. So no, definitely not an issue to tag the same animal more than once. Um, really great actually from a data perspective. Great, thanks. Um, the next question I have here, a pivot does a little bit to the harmful algal bloom rather than just the sharks. Um, so harmful algal bloom obviously are algae um, that are, as the, as the expression says, are harmful. The question uh, here is, are there any kind of animals that actually feed on these uh, algae that could be released basically to, to counteract the harmful effects of these algae? That's a great question. I've never heard that one before. Um, and I don't know the answer is the honest response. Um, not that I know of, um, and I don't know of it maybe, but I don't know of any projects looking into that currently. And the problem with releasing additional animals into an ecosystem is always a little tricky. You know, if you're yes. thinking, invasive species that's basically what happens if you do that right um, because they may not yes. have their normal predators and such um a, a second and follow-up question on this is uh what effect does septic tank leakage have on the ecosystem yeah so um there's been there has been some work done on that um there's a couple of papers uh, which indicate that um that yes Based eutrophication as a result of, of septic tanks can and are contrib contributing to harmful algal blooms. Um, so yeah, I think that's it's definitely definitely an issue. Right. Um, now you are part particularly focusing on bull sharks. Is there a reason why it's bull shark? There are a number of other shark species out there. Um, any particular reason that it's bull shark? And then as a follow up question, how do you fight these bull sharks to to tag them okay um yes so there are a number of um there are a number of different shark species that um, inhabit the indian river lagoon um but a previous project um looking at uh shark demographics and abundance basically um indicate indicated to us that um, bull sharks are the most abundant shark species so um, that's the reason that we're working with them. They're, they're easy to catch. It's a, an important nursery for these animals um, and they're accessible for us, basically. Um, they're also hardy. So bringing them to the boat and being able to work on them the, on the boat um, is for the most part relatively easy. And we know that they can handle the tags well as well. Um, in terms of bringing them to the boat, basically we're, we're catching them on the drum lines. Um, there's a, a really long line that attaches. The drum line is basically a heavy weight that sits on the, on, the, um, on the floor of the Indian River Lagoon, wherever we put these drum lines. And there's a long line um, that comes from that, which essentially has a baited hook at the end. And the sharks will basically grab that bait, hopefully hook themselves. Um, and then are free to swim around that weight. Um, so they can be on there for, for a while without too much stress um, in theory. And then we're able to basically go and pull this line up and pull the drum weight onto the boat and then very slowly bring, uh, sort of like pull the line in until we have the shark up next to the boat. Um, we'll pull it up alongside the boat. If the shark's too big to bring on board, then I'll put the tag on, sort of leaning over the side of the boat. If it's small enough that we can safely bring it on board, we'll, we'll bring it on board the boat, put the hose in its mouth so that it can still breathe, quickly work it up, put the tag on, and then be soon. Very interesting. You mentioned that the uh, sharks are affected by water temperature and also visibility, and, and that may have to do with them seeing um, their prey. Um, have you? Are there any data on uh, the ocean warming and if that has affected the behavior of the bull sharks? Um, I don't know specifically if there's anything for that for the bull sharks. 
um, there's a lot of there's a lot of information about um, how sharks are responding to to warming temperatures. You know, there's it, it's multifaceted. Um, you know, fish populations um, are are changing where they're spending time and how they're moving, um, and often these are important prey species for different shark species. So obviously, if prey are moving, then sharks are, are more than likely going to follow. Um, but there's there's a lot a, a lot of stuff going on both ecologically and physio physiologically. Um, so I mentioned that you know it's it's easier for some shark species to be more active when it's warmer. Um, and for example, with the juvenile lemon sharks, um, I tended to find that they spent a lot more time resting during the the cooler. Uh, winter months than they did during the summer. So their, their fine scale activity can, can change seasonally. Um, and we can start to try and use some of this information to potentially project forward what impact, like what impacts there might be as a result of climate change on, on their behavior as well. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Lauren. We are out of time. Um, I want to remind everybody that our next um, research and action is next week, Thursday at 1 p.m. With that, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, everybody, for calling in. We hope to see you next week again. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks.